Welcome to episode 67 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent writing crime fiction inspired by true crime FBI cases. In this episode, we get to speak to retired agent John Chesson, who served in the FBI for 25 years. During most of his bureau career, John primarily worked cybercrime as an investigator and supervisor of computer intrusion cases and as the coordinator of the Philadelphia and San Francisco Bay Area InfraGuard programs. However, in this episode of FBI Retired Case File Review, John is interviewed about a hate crime civil rights matter from his early days in the FBI. The case involved the investigation of seven South Philadelphia neighbors suspected of violating the civil rights of an African-American woman by vandalizing the home she had just rented on their block. The case was assigned to John and his co-case agent, Christina Kibbe. Mike Katz, a wheelchair-bound man who lived on the street, agreed to become their cooperating witness and to help John and Christina gather the evidence needed to prove that damaging the house was a racially motivated scheme to make the house uninhabitable and to intimidate and discourage the woman from moving into the neighborhood. Katz courageously recorded consensually monitored conversations with the subjects and testified as the star witness in the subsequent trial. All of the people involved were found guilty. On October 21st, 1999, FBI Director Louis Free awarded Michael Katz the 18th annual Louis E. Peters Memorial Service Award for his selfless commitment to protect victims of crime. This Citizen Award was sponsored by the Society of Former Special Agents of the FBI. The full citation can be read in this episode's show notes. This case review includes two surprising happily ever after conclusions and an unexpected tragedy. I wish I could take credit for the fact that this episode follows last week's episode also about a relationship between an agent and his informant. But it really is just a coincidence. Last week's episode, of course, was the episode with Jim Huggins about Mark Putnam's tragic relationship with his informant, Susan Smith. This week's episode is also about an agent's relationship with his informant, but it is a positive example of how those relationships should work. In many of the interviews I've done on FBI Retired Case File Review, we've talked about how important informant development and cooperating witness relationships can be to the successful conclusion of cases. When the relationship is a healthy relationship, as is the case in the one with John Chesson and Michael Katz, it's a beautiful thing. As you may recall, in episode 44, I actually did a interview, a case review with one of my cooperating witnesses from a telemarketing case. And way back in episode four, we talked with retired agent Judy Tyler about the importance of informant development, cooperating witness development. And of course, for those of you who have read my FBI crime thriller, Pay to Play, you know that the main focus of that story are the relationships that both my female character, Carrie Wheeler, and her male partner, Everett Hildebrand, have with their informants. So there you have it. The secret's out. Not only is it important to have great investigative skills, great interviewing skills, but being able to develop and have sincere relationships with boundaries, with informants, is a crucial part of being an FBI agent. 
That's the end of my FBI training lecture for today. I uh, do want to thank you again, those of you who have picked up a copy of my FBI crime thriller about a female FBI agent investigating corruption in the Philadelphia strip club industry. The new book cover has been a big hit, but remember, pay to play is the same book with a new look. When you pick up a copy of pay to play for yourself or as a gift for someone you know loves crime fiction, you're helping to defray the cost for me to continue producing ad-free content on a weekly basis. Plus, as you can tell from the fantastic reviews, pay to play is a great read. So keep the reviews as well as the tweets, posts, and emails coming. Thank you. And here's the show. I want to introduce my guest, John Chesson. Hi, John. Hi, Jerry. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Now, when I first reached out to you. I thought that we would be talking about cybercrime because that's what you were doing at the end of your career. And then you reminded me about this fascinating case, this uh, housing discrimination hate crime case that was in the news uh, in Philadelphia. We were assigned in Philadelphia together. And I thought, yes, this is the one that we should talk about. Yeah, I thought it was a very good human interest story to talk about this, about how we got help uh, with a witness, how being an investigator could be quite exciting at times. I have been working cybercrime the later part of my career. I started out actually working uh, violent crimes, uh, drug gangs, and uh, organized crime. Uh, in 19, it was, this case happened in 1996. Uh, I was about six years uh, in the Bureau at the time, and I was assigned to the counterterrorism squad, which also worked uh, hate crimes. So in the 1990s, there was a lot of hate crimes that were vandalism related, and a lot of those hate crimes do tend to be vandalism related. This often made it difficult uh, to find a witness, either because they're happening late at night and no one's seeing it, or you know, no innocent witnesses are seeing it. Or if neighbors see it, they're unwilling to report on their neighbors. Basically, a hate crime is an act uh, motivated by prejudice or bias. Uh, To be a hate crime, the act must be criminal, not merely expression of intolerance of opinion. Uh, Certain offenses uh, become a hate crime because of what motivates the criminal act. So when certain crimes are committed because of the victim's real or perceived race, color, religion, national origin, or ancestry, a hate crime has been committed. So the intent of the people or the person committing the act is an important part to prove. So by the spring of 1996, I had investigated probably uh, a dozen hate crime vandalisms. At that point, I was a little burnt out on it. I was kind of looking forward to changing my focus on other violations, uh, and I was eager to hand this off to a rookie so that I could focus on this new cybercrime cases that were, were starting to become pretty important back then. I knew we were getting a new agent on the squad, and her name is uh, Christina Kibbe. Uh, she was assigned to the CT squad that I was on. We instantly became friends. Um, we got to know each other uh, before this happened. I was off on, I think, on a SWAT operation at the time where she, when she got her first case assigned to her, and she became the lead investigator on a hate crime vandalism. Were you her training agent? I was going to mm-hmm. say, I take it because you had worked some of those cases that she would come to you to, you know, ask questions. I wasn't assigned as a trading agent, but I was one of the more experienced uh, people on the squad. We had a lot of very experienced people on the squad, but I, I had taken over a lot of the hate crime investigations. So, yeah, naturally she would come to me for advice on on how to proceed. Most of the time uh, when you respond to a hate crime, the first thing you got to do is go out to the neighborhood and start canvassing the neighborhood. Uh, let me get some of the facts of the case so you kind of understand what was occurring at that time. 
So on June 6, 1996, Samantha, a young African-American female from North Philly area, decided to get her own place. Uh, she found a row house in South Philly that was perfect. She visited the property and decided she loved it, so she went back to, uh, to sign a lease after a short visit to the property on South Franklin Street. Neighbors were watching as she visited the property. The next day, she returned to the property with her three-year-old nephew to find the house destroyed. Windows were shot out. There's Bondo putty uh, in all the keyholes. If you know what Bondo putty is, it's that kind of putty you usually put on cars to try to cover up holes and everything. You paint over it. It comes very hard very quick. And they put that into the locks of the doors. And the front door had been kicked in. She walked inside to examine the damage, saw that there was like a waterfall coming down the front steps of the stairway from broken pipes that were from the upstairs bathroom. Uh, she stood inside the house just as the ceiling collapsed on the downstairs floor right in front of her from the weight of the water running all night long. Uh, she called the police who reported it as a hate crime. Reporters showed up. They covered the story uh, in the local newspaper, which is a Philadelphia Inquirer. Is there anything at that time that indicates that it's a hate crime? We know that this African-American woman was moving into this neighborhood. Was the neighborhood, did they have any other African-Americans living in the neighborhood? No, this, any was, an all, this was an all-white neighborhood. A lot of neighborhoods, uh, at least at that time, weren't intermingled and this happened to be an all-white block. No one in the neighborhood was uh, of any other ethnic origin. So I think it was perceived that this was a hate crime. And even the indication of it may be in a hate crime, uh, the FBI has to go investigate it and see if they can confirm that it is. Agent Kibbe, eager to start her new case, she was looking around for someone to do the neighborhood. I, Like I said, I would happen to be out of town. A lot of people in the squad were... I guess, busy at that time. So she went and grabbed Kathy Lambert to go out and canvas the neighborhood looking for witnesses. Hey, you had mentioned the name Kathy Lambert, and I just wanted to remind everyone that I interviewed uh, Kathy Lambert on the podcast on episode 10, and she talked about being in charge, being the supervisor of the Philadelphia Joint Terrorism Task Force, the JTTF, uh, during her time uh, in Philly. So, I'm sorry, go back to the story. <laughs> okay. I, I, I've done this a number of times, and of all the times, like a dozen, at least a dozen times, I never turned up one person that was willing to talk about what their neighbor had done. So, the very next day, uh, Agent Kibbe got a call from someone on South Franklin Street. She was sitting right across from me, and she looked up and she says, this guy on the phone saw everything. Well, I immediately knew that that was a rare moment that anyone would actually call after Camus. So I told her, I said, we got to meet him right now. Don't wait. So she set up a meeting at the McDonald's in South Philly. It was away, away from the neighborhood a little bit, uh, but it was real easy to find and get to quickly. Uh, the caller described himself as, easy to uh, to recognize because he was in a wheelchair. So I'm like, oh, okay. So we had to come up with a plan, you know, how we were going to deal with this guy in a wheelchair. So we we were not dressed that day to, to go down and do a covert meeting down in South Philly. Usually we wear suits because our, usually our first response is to go out and do canvas a neighborhood. So we need to look professional. But if we're going to meet with somebody that we don't really want to give them away, we usually would dress down. But this particular day, we were dressed in suits. It was a very hot, humid July. Uh, we arrived at the McDonald's and started watching for this guy in a wheelchair. Really didn't know what to look for. And then we see him. Uh, he's in his late 20s, uh, white guy, no shirt. All no tattooed shirt? Up. <laughs> no shirt. <laughs> uh, and he's got tattoos all up and down his arms and, and chest and has this long, straight brown hair. I kind of was picturing uh, like uh, Born on the Fourth of July, the Tom Cruise character. <laughs> it was that yeah. kind of thing that jumped out at me. 
so anyhow, uh, we saw him operating an electric wheelchair and moving about 15 miles an hour up the street at a pretty, pretty, pretty quick pace in a wheelchair, and he's coming right towards us. Uh, we had thought we were going to transfer him to the car, but that wasn't going to work because the wheelchair is in was about 500 pounds, and it was it was just too big to handle. There wasn't any way we were going to be able to move into the car or or into the the restaurant to be out of sight. So we had to stand there in the hot sun and started interviewing. And his name was Mike Cates, and he says he saw everything. So what he describes is after Samantha, the victim, uh, left the neighborhood on June 6th, Mike was sitting on his front porch, as most people do in South Philly in the summer evenings. He saw Felix DeMiro Sr. and two of Felix's sons. Felix had three sons, but he only saw two of them, Michael and Felix Jr. Uh, he called Felix Jr. Sr. Big Felix. Uh, one of... Uh, uh, one of Michael's and and Felix Jr.'s uh, friends, Joey. And there was also um, Ed Majors, who was the next-door neighbor to where Samantha was going to move into. They were the main people uh, vandalizing the house. Mike described the scene was kind of like a party atmosphere. They were high-fiving each other, parading around with a, a BB gun, pellet gun, air rifle shooting at the window. Basically, they did, they, like, this is not typical in that a lot of these hate crime vandalisms were happening in the dark of night when no one's really seeing it. These guys were very bold and parading around. So there's a lot of neighbors out witnessing this, including Mike. So the next day, Mike told us why he was telling us this because, because, uh, he was out there when he saw Samantha return the next day with a small child. And Samantha reminded him of the young African-American Muslim woman who cared for him as his uh, care, home care nurse after Mike had injured his back in a, in a work-related uh, injury. Mike thought that Big Felix was escalating things. He was known as the mayor of the block, and he was bullying people around. Mike thought that someone was going to get hurt, and his thought by telling us what happened was that maybe we could step in and, and stop Big Felix from threatening people who couldn't defend themselves and, and maybe stop the activity before it escalates into somebody getting hurt. Well, let me ask you a question, because um, you said they were doing this out in the open, so people in the neighborhood obviously knew the same thing that you know, your witness knew. And it just, it's, it's just kind of strange that Agent Kibbe and Agent Lambert had gone out and done a neighborhood and nobody spoke up. And the person who finally decides to speak up is the guy in the wheelchair. Right. And, and, uh, and he told me that he saw Agent Kibbe out there that day and she never saw him. She was like talking to people and kind of walking her way around the neighborhood but because I think he was back on his porch, she didn't see him. So he had to to go to a neighbor and ask what happened, and and she had handed out her business card. So he looked at the business card, memorized the number on it, and then that was the number he called the next day. Mm. So he he kind of he wanted to kind of bring this to some uh, conclusion to to at least to try to take control of this, this situation that he seemed like it was out of control. One of the big, one of the fears he had about Big Felix too was that he really believed that he had some mafia connections, which, you know, in South Philly, it's always not abnormal to align yourself with the mafia because there's a long history there and people at least on that street, were believing that that story. Uh, he also, you know, Michael Michael also thought that uh, Big Felix had connections with corrupt police officers and city council members. We thought it was a little bit too much, you know, when Mike was telling us this, but 
as far as being a witness, he seemed very credible, and maybe he was caught up in you know this power that Big Felix had over this this small block in South Philly, and maybe believed he had more power than he really did. So, although uh, they describe what the hate crime was, and we have to show intent and motivation, that the crime itself, we didn't have any indication that the motivation was, you know, because of their bias or prejudice. So we had we told Mike that we needed his help to record Big Felix saying why he did it. So he's he is only able at that time to help you with the identification of who was responsible. But that whole Correct. motivation and intent thing, you still need to work on that. Correct. We were not going to be able to show that it was actually a hate crime unless we proved the intent. So we asked him to wear a body wire against Big Felix to see if he would confess to why he did it. Mike's first response was, no way, don't really want to get involved. I told him, think about it. So we gave him our pager numbers. We didn't have cell phones back then. Gave him our pager numbers and said, call us, you know, call us if you change your mind. So now that we had at least a witness and we kind of know who the doers were, we decided to go check out the uh, victim, which was Samantha. So we went to visit Samantha at her job, which she was a waitress in South at a South Philly diner. I immediately liked her when I met her. I, I thought she was attractive, friendly, smart, someone that you would like to have as a neighbor. I know it shouldn't matter, but you know when you're presenting, especially when intents involved, if you can, if you have a victim that comes off very friendly and nice and pleasant, the reason couldn't be because, you know, they did something to provoke this. And that I thought that was an important part in, in us deciding that, yeah, we have, a, we have a good case to build here. Basically, at this point, um, this, was, this was pretty good. We had an eyewitness and a sympathetic victim. Uh, we just needed some evidence to pursue a prosecution in this. So later that night, uh, Agent Kibbe gets a page from Mike. She finds out that uh, Big Felix is chasing Mike's friend, John, up the street with a machete. Mike's very <laughs> upset. Yeah, Mike gets very upset, <laughs> and he wants uh, Kibbe to, to help his friend. At that moment, the only thing we really could do is Kibbe had to call the, the police and report that there was a fight on the street. Because the police are going to get there a lot faster, and they could, you know, usually their presence alone will kind of diffuse the, the, the argument of the fight. But because of that incident, Mike felt like his friend was really in danger. He was willing at this point to discuss with us wearing a wire. Did you like, ever find out what the whole machete thing was about? Not really. I think based on the behaviors of, of Big Felix, this is just the way he was a bully so he just if he if someone crossed him he would come off crazy and violent against them i don't know if he was intended to really hurt him but mike perceived it that way so uh, i think that was just his style of you know intimidation. showing showing his yeah power and intimidation on that block no, no one on that block felt confident enough to challenge him except for Mike coming forward to us. Everyone else kept quiet. So uh, at this point, we had to get the U.S. Attorney's Office involved. So we had a prosecutor assigned and a DOJ attorney assigned from Washington, D.C. With hate crimes, there's a lot more uh, Department of Justice oversight uh, because those crimes are so so difficult to prove the Department of Justice felt, felt necessary to actually put investigative guidelines on it and have a DOJ attorney monitor the evidence collection portion of it, basically to make sure we cover all potential gaps in the investigation and that they're consistently covered. So there's a lot of oversight on, on uh, uh, hate crime investigations, or actually any civil right crime investigations. So we had... Uh, Assistant Attorney, U.S. Attorney uh, Faith Taylor. She's probably one of the best trial attorneys I've ever, ever had the pleasure to work with. Uh, she was a former Philadelphia DA's office, so she, you know, did a lot of file, uh, trials 
uh, at the DA level and then moved over to the U.S. Attorney's Office. So we were very fortunate to get her on our team. And then also uh, Nelson Thayer was the Department of Justice attorney that was assi- also assigned. So we kind of worked as a team. It was Agent Kibbe, myself, Nelson, and Faith, and we always collaborated on on the next move in this investigation. So we we brought Mike to the FBI office and uh, we discussed the strategy um, and put a Nagger recorder, uh, which is these old uh, reel-to-reel recorders, miniaturized reel-to-reel reel, reel recorders that we had back then. They were a little difficult to conceal, but uh, they were the best quality sound. And they, I think the tape went on for a couple of hours, so it was it was usually the one of choice at that time. And then we also put a transmitter on him, and this was really so that we can hear in real time whether he's under any danger or not if we had to step in. So Mike came to the FBI office in his electric wheelchair from South Philly. It took him about 20 minutes to get there, uh, kind of weaving in and out of uh, neighborhoods through South Philly. He was concerned about being followed, so he he kind of um, took a couple of different routes to make sure no one was following him all the way to the FBI office. So at that time, too, when we wire up a witness at, at, at the beginning, at the first time, we want to have a, a lot of control over that uh, recording device. So it was important for the agents to turn on the device and then also be the ones that turn off the device and not give any control of the recording turning off and on to the person conducting the recording. This is always a practice we we like to do early on in wiring people people up so that we we had we could prove the integrity of that that recording. So back then the the transmitters we used had to be more or less line of sight. It couldn't be too far off the block. So we had to find an excuse to be close to where Mike was making this recording, and he was going to do this on his block in that neighborhood. So the plan was for Agent Kibbe and I to go to the vandalized house as if we were collecting evidence while Mike sat on his porch and talked to Big Felix. It's important to know that Mike was married, had two small kids, uh, his son, Mikey was about five years old, and then he had a daughter that was about eight years old. Mike's wife uh, didn't know anything about Mike planning to help the FBI make a case against Big Felix. So everything was working to plan. We got to South Franklin Street, uh, Agent Kibbe and I, uh, late in the afternoon. Uh, We parked directly in front of the victim house. We thought it was a good thing that they saw us come onto that street and it would help Mike with the conversation about what happened at that house. So we carried a box of search equipment, just the box to carry the transmitter in so that we can listen to Mike's conversation with Big Felix. So we we get in inside the house and immediately turn on the receiver. And the first thing we hear is Big Felix saying, you did it, Mike. Why'd you do it? Well, our hearts kind of jumped up in our throats. We're thinking, Big Felix just discovered the wire on Mike. So we we were like drawing our guns and heading towards the front door, still listening to the recording. And and just as we get to the front door, we hear Mike say, Mikey, tell Big Felix what you did. At that moment, we realized Felix was teasing Mike's son by, uh, okay. by like accusing him of something to get him to react to it. It was just he <laughs> was just teasing the little kid. So the conversation went on with Mike and Big Felix for a little while. Uh, it was perfect. Uh, Big Felix confessed to everything. Uh, he put the bondo putty in the locks. He shot the windows out, and he even described why he did it. The bulk of the case was made with this one recording. You know, once Mike and Big Field stopped talking, then then we left the house and headed back to the FBI office. And Mike caught up with us at the FBI office a little a little bit later. So Felix is basically bragging, I mean, because you guys are right across the street, and he's just kind of bragging to Mike. Yeah, exactly. This was normal behavior for him. 
the conversation started because we walked into the the house, and then the, Mike says something like, "Well, what actually happened?" And then Big Felix just started bragging about it. Hmm. So yeah, everything just kind of came out on tape. So we we were thinking at this point we're we're pretty much done, but you know we have to collect the evidence and you know make sure procedural wise we got everything together because this is going to be the the bulk of our case. But uh, you know because I was going to turn off the recording too when we saw Mike when he got to the office we couldn't say anything. You know, we try to coach the witness that don't say anything till we actually turn off the recording. Because you don't want to enter, you have to turn that whole recording over to the defense. You don't want to have to start having side conversations that you don't intend. So, but I could see agitation on Mike's face just as I'm finally turning off the recording. And he says that uh, Big Felix thinks someone's on the street is talking to the cops. Oh, really? And yeah, it's because someone called the cops on him last night about the fight with John. Now everyone on that street knows to not call the cops because Big Felix has connections with the cops. Apparently, they had somebody connected to dispatch to kind of overhear things and reports it back to Big Felix. Is is what we found out later. So he he has a suspicion that someone on the street talking, he thinks it's a neighbor he's had conflicts with in the past. I think her name is Big Betty. So he's gonna teach <laughs> Big, Big Felix, Be- Big Betty. <laughs> yeah. He's gonna he's gonna teach Big Betty a lesson and he's gonna burn her house down. Well this is a row house in South Philly. If you burn one house in the middle you know, one house in the middle of the row, the houses next to it are gonna burn. Well Mike lives on that same row, but Big Felix lives on the other street or, or the other side of the street. So if that row burns, it's not going to really impact him. And Mike really believes that Big Felix is going to follow through with this threat. So now we got a we got a situation. <laughs> we can't we we can't ignore this threat. So at this point, we have you know we trusted Mike. I mean, Mike did what he said he was going to do. He you know, if he says he's going to stay up all night and watch the the block to see what Big Phyllis is going to do anything, we we're 100% sure he was going to call us. But, you know, the problem we had is, would that be enough? I mean, if he's calling us, are we going to be able to react in time? It was kind of difficult to do any kind of covert surveillance on the block. This lock's so small. And us sitting on any neighboring block, they're going to kind of notice somebody doesn't belong there. So we thought the only thing we could possibly do was to get a cop car to kind of frequent that street to maybe deter them from following through. And then maybe a a day or two later, he'll forget about it. So we needed a a trusted contact with the local police district. So we contacted an FBI liaison officer at the local PD and told them, about this threat. Later that night, Mike Page is Kibby. Uh, she called Mike to discover that the police had a spotlight on the house. What? This That's was not really covert bad. surveillance. <laughs> no, that, that, this is really bad. The whole neighborhood now had been alerted that something was up. So that so this spotlight is not on the house that was vandalized, but on the house that was he was Big Felix was. Threatening to burn down. Correct. And, and only a only, few people would have. Oh, right, yeah. oh, right. Only Mike and Big Felix knew of this conversation. Uh, so now Mike's at risk. You know, the damage was done as, as soon as the cops came out there and put the spotlight. But, you know, he calls uh, Kibby in a panic, you know, get the spotlight off the house, get the spotlight off the house. Kibby calls the local PD and she demands that they turn off the spotlight, but they and they turn they turned it off, but it's it's already too late. So the next day we we meet with Mike and you know immediately, you know we have to fess up that we we messed up, right? We the information about which house it was probably should not have been shared, but it sometimes and the cops always complain, <laughs> complain that we don't share enough information. And, you know, they don't understand why we're withholding stuff. 
that, that's that dynamic kind of played out not to our favor this time because we shared too much information. So that was, but that kind of changed the whole dynamic of the case as well. So we we talked to Mike. Basically, the liaison officer must have shared too much information is all we could conclude. And we failed to protect the exact address of the threat statement. So we Mike still believed he could talk his way out of this with big fields. He may have been almost a little overconfident about his 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 ways to convince people, but we thought we really didn't have much choice uh, because we just confirmed their suspicions if we stepped in and did anything else. So, yeah, so we let him go back to the neighborhood. And then, um, so Mike goes back to the neighborhood. He still thought that, you know, he could assuage uh, Big Fields' uh, suspicions. However, later that night, Big Fields' oldest son, Dom, paid him a visit. Now, Dom is Big Fields' uh, oldest son. He was not, according to Mike, he was not there the night the vandalism ha- happened against uh, Samantha's house. Dom and Mike were best friends, but Dom was kind of the enforcer for Big Felix. So let's say if Big Felix ordered a hit on Mike, Dom would be the one to do it. He was kind of the leader of, you know, or I guess the lieutenant of their little gang uh, that would carry out Big Felix's orders. Now, as far as you know, Big Felix has never ordered a hit or ordered any of his to kill anybody before. Right. As far as I know, that was not never occurred, but Mike believed it was, right? So the intimidation would be there if Big Felix or if if Dom suspected him. And when he got the visit from, from Dom, he knew something was up, right? So Mike told me how Dom and he get, became friends. I think that's important to understand the story as well. Basically, when Mike first moved on to South Franklin Street, he saw Dom and uh, his brothers, Mike and Felix Jr., and um, a friend of theirs, Joey Greenwood, uh, beat up a, a black man. So Mike was kind of like a scrappy, skinny little guy, I don't know, maybe 125 pounds back then uh, when he was before his injury. He couldn't stand to see bullies beating up on someone. It's just you know, he, he's that, that's kind of the way he has been his whole life. He's always defending people from from what I hear from him. So he stepped in to defend this black guy. Uh, Dom and his gang turned on Mike, but Michael was or Mike was a uh, martial arts black belt and was able to defend himself and pretty much kick butt against four guys. So. And Mike is telling you this story, so yeah, should, should we believe all of it? <laughs> you're <laughs> you're hearing his side of it, but um, from that, though, Dom gained some respect for Mike's ability, and they became friends. And, in fact, Dom was so impressed about with the martial arts stuff, he started taking lessons from Mike. Mike started teaching these guys martial arts, and that's how he kind of gained a bond with uh, with Dom. Then years later, when Mike uh, broke his back in a uh, work-related incident, Dom was the one that came and helped him build uh, build a ramp to his house so he could get in and out with the the wheelchair and a lift to get on up on his porch. Mike told me that Dom used to come over every night and help carry him up to bed, and every morning he would come over before he went to work and carried. Mike downstairs so that he could get in his wheelchair and and get around and during the day. So Mike, Dom showed a lot of compassion for Mike and kept visiting Mike throughout his recovery. Mike and uh, Dom became very close and and they were even planning to open a business together uh, with the lawsuit money Mike was going to get from the expected act uh, from that he expected from his accident. But Mike knew Dom couldn't forgive betrayal. So while in Mike's house, Dom confronted him uh, about the police showing up the previous night. And Dom took out his pistol and pointed it at Mike's head. Now, we have no 
evidence this occurred because Mike had no recording device on him and it was basically Mike's word. So there was no way we were going to be able to charge this in the case. But it also made us understand that Mike needs a little bit more protection. So Mike was insisted that it wasn't him. Uh, Dom knew that Mike's father was a retired Philly cop, so maybe Mike had said something to his father. We're thinking, you know, thinking that's what Dom's probably thinking the excuse is. And then Dom physically searches Mike, so thank goodness he didn't have a recording device on him because Mike was clean at that time. So we felt like at that point Mike had passed the test, but uh, Mike freaked out after Dom left and called Agent Kibbe. Yeah, so now, I can imagine so. Yeah, he's had a, a gun to his head, and now he's being patted down by his best friend, who I guess is right. looking for a recording device. Yeah, I, I, I can see why he yeah. would be freaked out and a little scared. So, so the stakes are high, higher now. Um, you know, having Big Felix's uh, recorded confession wasn't enough. Now we had to, you know, um, you know, but the, and Dom, who now we saw we saw as a threat, um, he didn't have anything to do with the vandalism, but he did threaten the witness, which makes him part of the crime. We just didn't have any evidence of that. Um, All right, let me let me back up for a minute because I thought that the recording that Mike had with Big Felix, you know, about him confessing to you know being an active participant in the vandalism and the fact that it was you know based on you know hate and discrimination. I thought that was enough. That was enough for Big Felix, but they're all the co-conspirators. We had to understand their part of it. Okay. Okay. So we really needed, it was more important as now to make sure we got everyone because now everyone was was potentially a threat. But we still had this dilemma that Dom was, although being a, an enforcer, wasn't, Mike said he wasn't there that night. So we just figured we had to get make the best case as, as we could. And I think Mike's belief was if we made a strong enough case uh, that Big Felix would take the rap for everyone and, and, it would never have to go to trial. So Mike was worried uh, really now about his family, and he wasn't sure Dom was going to trust him, so we, we had to get his family out of the neighborhood. So we moved Mike's family to a secure lo- location that night, right after that occurred, and then out of town the next next day so we could get them out of play. Mike really felt like he couldn't leave because Dom w- would try to, track him down. So we had to somehow regain Dom's trust. So that became the concentration of the case at that time, too, was to get the heat off of Mike. Mike could work with Dom to try to get him to to trust him and then try to gather the remaining evidence that we needed to to pursue the case. So where did uh, Mike tell Dom and the rest of the neighbors his wife and kids went? So, um, so Mike and his wife kind of had a volatile relationship. Uh, mostly she was having troubles, uh, dealing with him, you know, being confined to a wheelchair. And it was pretty obvious to the neighbors that they were constantly having problems. So they just used that excuse, you know, something that was really occurring as an excuse that they had a fight and she left with the kids. And pretty much everyone bought that. This also opened up an opportunity for us uh, to, for Mike to actually spend more time with the co-conspirators uh, because, like I said, they were friends, and if they could get over the mistrust that, that occurred from the night before, uh, that maybe you know they would talk about what they did. So that was that that kind of became our angle. We also needed to give Mike because we couldn't control every meeting with the co-conspirators because they could just pop over his house any time. Uh, we need to give Mike a recording device uh, that he could turn on and off it himself and easy to conceal. And back then, we, you know, the best thing we had was those micro cassette recorders. That, you know, basically had a 30-minute tape on each, on each side. You had to flip it if it was going to go more than 30 minutes. 
So we gave him one of those, and he was able to conceal it pretty well within his wheelchair. And then whenever someone, one of the co-conspirators came up or he felt like he was going to be threatened, he would just turn the recording on. We also instructed him that once he made a tape, he was to immediately page me, and we were to meet so that I could get that tape and preserve the evidence. Now, it was difficult because he being in a wheelchair, he couldn't just like pick up and go too far off the block. So we picked a a place to meet under the uh, stadium in the park uh, because a lot of drug deals went on back there. So he could always use the excuse he was meeting somebody on a drug deal. And I would just dress up as a, you know, one of the kids on the, on the block with, you know, untucked shirt and baseball cap or something and go out there behind the stadium and, and meet with him. Well, let me ask you a question because you said something about he would just pretend it was meeting for the drug deal. Did he buy yeah. drugs or was he selling drugs or, you know, I'm interested in <laughs> what you meant by that. Um, yeah, it could be either, but, uh, I think he would be buying drugs. They were all drug users, I think, on that block, and, and that was, you know, maybe it was pot or Xanax or something like that that was pretty common back then. And he wasn't selling them, so he would be the purchaser of them. That would be the excuse. Okay. A few nights later, Mike got a call from Dom's friend, Drew invited him to go to the movies. Now, Mike thought this was kind of odd. Mike knew Drew and hung out with Drew, but only when Dom was there. So the fact that Drew was asking Mike to go to the movies, Mike thought Dom was setting him up to get whacked. That's pretty much what he told us. So we're, you know, we're still trying to gain Dom's trust. So we basically conducted a rolling surveillance on Mike and and hooked him up with a transmitter uh, that time as well, so that if he needed our help, we had a code word, we would swoop up and hopefully get there in time to to rescue him. But they went to the movies and Mike headed back home and nothing nothing happened. So we went on home ourselves after that. Mike returned home after the movies and he had discovered that. Someone had crawled through the back window of his house, and he thought someone was still in the house. But Mm. before I get into that, I have to explain a little bit about Mike's uh, injury. Um, So although Mike had broken his back, his spinal cord was not, like, completely severed. He still had some ability to to straighten out his his legs, not physically, but uh, the doctors put, like, an electrode in his stomach hoping that one day he would fully regain his ability to walk. Uh, It would tense his muscles up so that he could actually use his legs as kind of stiff stilts and he could use his arms to kind of work his way up the stairs. And it took him kind of years to get that kind of strength and ability to get around. So it's important to understand that because he could get around up and down the stairs on his own, but he still had no feeling in in his legs. So Mike worked his way up the stairs, you know, with this this mechanism, still thinking someone's in the house. And he had a a samurai sword that he had from his martial arts day kind of hidden next to his bed. So he he grabbed that and started searching the house, you know, using the sword to potentially protect him, you know, looking for someone in the house. And he saw evidence of someone's kind of scattering things around and, and looking for something. Uh, but he never found anyone in the house. Now, Mike had a German Shepherd dog uh, named Lady, and the only person that could ever get in the house without Mike there to co- keep Lady under control was Dom. So Mike concluded that Dom must have searched the house while he was out at the movie, and that was the purpose of Drew taking Mike out to the movie, just to get him out of the house so Dom can search it. Again, we never really figured out what... Dom was looking for, but, you know, we attribute that activity back to Dom. Did Dom ever confess to it? No, we never had any evidence that that occurred. But it's important to to know what's motivating Mike, you know, each step of this so that he's under constant fear that he's going to be killed. And that's, that's important to understand. So 
this also, because of this activity too, we realize we got to do something more to get the focus off of Mike. We can't, we can't passively just collect information here. We have to get involved in the case to get the focus off, off, off of Mike. So we felt that the more the FBI was present on the street, they would focus on the fact that we were there asking questions as opposed to what activities that maybe they thought Mike was doing. So we figured if we can get one of the co-conspirators to talk to us, that we could get some of the heat off of Mike and maybe get it on a co-conspirator so that that maybe they return on themselves. And we decided the co-conspirator, Ed Majors, he wasn't part of the DeMiro family. He wasn't really one that hung out with them. He just participated in the crime that we, if we went to go talk to him, uh, he was going to be the weakest link and we could put a little pressure on him to maybe be a, a witness for us and, you know, back up Mike's story about who did what. And we didn't really need him to say anything as much as we needed to just be seen entering the house, hitting Ed's house and stay there as long as possible. That was kind of our plan to put a little bit of pressure on the co-conspirator. Colin, make Dom and the rest of them and Felix believe he might be cooperating. Right, right. That, and we did that to, specifically to protect Mike from further scrutiny. So uh, Agent Kibbe and I uh, waited until early evening before we arrived at Ed's house. Ed's wife, Liz, opens the door and uh, let us into the house. The neighborhood was watching. Everyone's out on the street like they, they are, usually are uh, early evening. Kibbe asked what they know about what happened next door. Uh, Samantha had said that Ed knew exactly where to go to turn off the water. And Ed responded, said, yeah, that's because my house was taking on water. So well, Samantha, Samantha, the victim, when she saw that waterfall coming down the stairs, then Ed, the potential new neighbor, was the one who ran and turned it off. Correct. But it sounds right. like it wasn't because of Samantha. <laughs> no, he didn't he want... Was, Right. He was motivated to, to save his basement from filling up with water. It was slightly lower than hers, so he was taking on water. So we asked Ed to see, his, see the basement. Again, our goal is just to stay in there as long as possible. As long as they're entertaining our questions, we're achieving our goal. So while in the basement, Agent Kibby noticed a can of Bondo putty on the shelf. I didn't see it. I was talking to Ed, so I, I wasn't really looking around as much. We went back upstairs and continued to talk, and then we asked Ed if he ever used Bondo putty. While we were talking, we got a knock at the door, uh, at the front door, and Liz answered. It was Dom. Wow. And Dom wanted to see who was there. He he decided he was going to return a borrowed wrench that he took from Ed, and he asked Liz who's in the house, and Liz says the FBI was asking questions. So Dom le left. Well, this shook up Liz. Liz then goes downstairs into the basement as if she's doing laundry. And Agent Kibbe notices her, her go downstairs. She immediately follows because we don't know what she's going to do down there. Mm -hmm. And as soon as Kibbe uh, follows her down the basement, I get up and I'm like, well, why is she going down the basement? I start following her. And then as I get down to the bottom of the steps, I hear her saying, where's the putty? She's yelling at Liz, and I'm going, what is going on? <laughs> you know, she, and she said to Liz, I saw it on the shelf, and now it's gone. Liz starts crying, and then she, and then Liz buckles and then shows that she hit where she hit the can of Bondo putty. Well, now we had caught them in a lie, right? They said they initially had said that they didn't use Bondo putty. That was Ed's answer. But now they had a can of Bondo putty, and Liz wanted to cover up for the fact that there was Bondo putty down there. So she knew. And we were pretty sure the pressure was on them, that they were going to crack. Um, but at that point, we had we told them we, they were in a lot of trouble, and we you know, were hoping that they were, we would get their cooperation. We left them with that. But we accomplished our objectives being there, so we, we left. And we were still really concerned about Mike and, and his exposure um, to being under suspicion. 
So the Ed and Liz interview was good, but uh, we still needed to keep the pressure on. So we decided to go F, try the same thing the following, the next night uh, with another neighbor co-conspirator, Carrie and her husband. Carrie was pretty much the eyes on the block. You know, Mike had seen her on the street that night, but he didn't really know how she was involved. But we figured she saw everything, and we and we knew that she had a close relationship with Big Felix. So she probably told Big Felix, you know, about Samantha coming in and looking at the property. And she's the, she was pretty much the reason why Big Felix took the action that he did to vandalize the house. So we decided to talk to her and her husband the next day. You know, I remember when we arrived on the street, pretty much everyone is all on the street again, just like they were the night before. But I take it during the neighborhood, you know, canvas right after the event, Ed and Liz and Terry and her husband were, were all initially interviewed. Correct. So they, going well, back now. There was a, yeah, there was an attempt to interview them, but but we went back, right? And it's probably unusual for us to be back that much if we're not getting any information. The fact that we come back the next night probably puts a little bit more heat on, on Ed and Liz, because why would we come back the next night? So we're keeping the suspicion now, hopefully, on Ed. But we go to, we get to Terry and her husband sitting on their porch. We ask, hey, can we talk to you inside? And they, they refuse. They, they see what happened to Ed and Liz the night before. They don't, they don't want to even entertain us coming into their house. So we stood on the front step talking to them for a few minutes. Now, there were kids playing out on the street. I didn't notice that uh, the DeMiro boys and Joey kind of showed up on the street. They potentially were playing catch or playing ball or whatever, but then a, a line drive, a tennis, wet tennis ball hit A.J. Kibbe straight in the back. I knew that they were trying to taunt us a little bit. So, and I, and I'm, you know, I was sure that there, it was an intentional throwing of the ball uh, straight at her. So if they were challenging us, I knew that I need to identify that we were FBI agents so that no one on that block had any, you know, we weren't, we were wearing suits, so we're not marked as FBI, but I want to make sure that they understood that we were FBI agents and it's a, federal offense to assault an FBI agent. Right. So, so you had on suits. You didn't have on FBI raid jackets or anything like right. that. Right. We were we were all in suits. So they, they they could have said that they didn't know who we are, although we've been on the block enough and should have known by now. But I wanted to make sure the neighborhood knew who we were. So I hold up my badge and I walk towards Michael DeMiro, uh, identifying myself. And then, of course, we knew from Mike, uh, case that these guys were armed. They they carried weapons with them. So Kibby was was watching to make sure none of them were going to, you know, take any action at that point. We didn't really know what they were going to do. So Michael DeMiro looked like he wanted to fight me, but just then Uncle Dom shows up on the block, and now Uncle Dom is Big Felix's older brother, and he's the one that has a job that works with one of the city councilmen so he had some some level of political connections. He was very much a smooth talker. He kind of came out there and calmed it, or really distracted Agent Kibby and I while the younger DeMiro boys kind of left the street. You know, we talked to him for a few minutes. When things calmed down, we, we left the block and immediately reported that incident to the U.S. Attorney Faith Taylor, letting her know that you know they attempted to harass us while we were out there. Uh, it was a little bit more dangerous probably than we had taken for granted. We probably should have had a little bit more backup, but at that time we thought we were a little bit, you know, that they weren't going to do something like that, but they did. So the next day, uh, Mike sees Dom, and he's trying to find out what happened to us because Mike wasn't on the street that, that night uh, when they confronted us. Mike was trying to find out what happened through Dom because obviously he would have heard something. Or maybe Dom was still threatening him, but Dom at this point seemed to get over that mistrust with Mike and started talking to Mike. So Mike turns on the recording and records that conversation. So after the conversation, Mike calls me and we go for our meet under the uh, under the football stadium. 
And I could see this time he's coming up to me. We had, we had done a couple of these exchanges uh, before, but this time he was really agitated. And he says to me, uh, as soon as he gets close enough to me, he says, Dom was there. He said, he just made a recording with Dom, and Dom was at the house. Oh, Dom so at to, first, he, yeah, he hadn't seen him go in, so he didn't think Dom was there. Right. He didn't think Dom was there at all. But then Dom, in the recording, said that he went in and shot the toilet and broke the pipes. Um, he said, basically, Dom told him that, you know, as things start dying down, uh, he shows up and found out that they they attacked Samantha's house. And all they had done up to that point was put the bond of putty in the locks to symbolize keeping her out and to shoot out the windows. Dom said, that's not going to keep her out. So he goes and kicks in the front door, runs upstairs, breaks the pipes, shoots shoots the toilet. So he brings a, a weapon onto the property and, and uses that to further the crime. And then that created all the water damage that right. would prevent her from actually moving in. Yeah, that, that created the majority of the damage. So pretty much we got uh, Dom's confession on tape. And Mike was really upset by this because he didn't, he was friends with Dom and didn't think Dom, like he knew the side of Dom that Dom wasn't going to be that, you know, get involved in that. He thought he, I guess he'd gotten through to Dom and Dom had changed his ways or something, but Dom still wanted to please Big Felix and he did this, he, Mike thinks, to please his father. So basically, we we decided at this point we had enough evidence on all the co-conspirators. We we had to find a way to get Mike off the street, and also we, it would be good if we had another chance at other witnesses. So we decided to use uh, just to subpoena everyone on the block because we knew there was some intimidation going on with all the neighbors, and maybe one of them taken off the block, you know, would feel more free to provide us some information about the incident. That also allowed us to have an excuse to get Mike uh, Mike off the block as well. So that next day, uh, 12 FBI agents delivered about 30 grand jury subpoenas to every resident on that block. The subpoena delivered to Mike gave him a chance to disappear from Dom so that Dom wouldn't uh, come looking for him, gave him the perfect excuse because Mike, Mike used the excuse that he couldn't lie under oath uh, to protect Dom and, his, and, and Demiros uh, because he's expected to win a lot of money from his pending lawsuit for his back injury, and he didn't think perjury, you know, we, get, we fed him that, but he didn't think perjury was going to come off too good for his lawsuit if, if it was discovered he was lying. So he used that as the excuse to get off, get off the street. We thought we weren't going to take this to trial because we had such clear evidence on all the co-conspirators, but they decided to uh, uh, to fight it. Uh, in 1997, July of 1997, almost a year later, we arrested six co-conspirators, and then uh, the trial began. Actually, began a year after that, 1998 where Mike was our star witness, and all six were found guilty. Yeah, it's surprising to me that they would have gone to trial with the, you know, the evidence, the electronic uh, evidence that you had. It was hopeful for us that we still could, you know, all the way up until right before trial, we didn't identify that Mike was our, our witness. Uh, we gave him some snippets from from the uh you know, the transcripts from the tapes to kind of show certain things that they said. Uh, but they don't know, at that time, they didn't know how we gathered that information. And they kind of thought that we had recording devices all over the place where we could listen to everything that they say. And, you know, we kind of used that to our advantage a little bit. But uh, we were hoping we never had to reveal Mike as the witness. But because they took it to trial, we had to re- basically reveal everything and now it's important to make sure Mike stays well hidden from them being able to track him down. They were all convicted. Uh, I think the, the lightest sentence was a year went to Ed Majors because he ended up rolling and, and uh, testifying as a witness to reduce his sentence. But the rest of them got uh, somewhere anywhere from three to, uh, I think, nine years was the maximum one. Was that Big Phillips got nine years? No, actually, uh, Dominic got nine years for carrying a weapon on the scene. 
I think the maximum chargeable crime was five years, and Big Felix got the max for five years. The rest of them got three, and Dominic got nine. All right, because he had a a weapon in the use of the uh, of the crime. Right. Wow. Now, uh, what happened to? Uh, mm-hmm. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to ask you what what happened to to Mike. I take it he never returned back to the neighborhood. Right. He never returned back to the neighborhood. He actually moved uh, down south. Well, let me tell you a little bit about as a result of this case, too. Uh, Mike was awarded a Citizens Award from Louis Free. Uh, I think it was back in 2000. He was recognized for his bravery to stand up basically to these these bullies. Fantastic. And, he, well deserved. Well deserved. Yeah. And then another interesting note is Agent uh, Agent Kibbe. Yeah, wh- whatever happened to Agent <laughs> Kibbe? <laughs> uh, as as I said, she was a uh, young age. We were about the same age when she came in. I was uh, helping her with this case. I ended up taking the case to trial when she moved off the squad. Um, but we remained friends. In fact, we became rom- romantically involved. And uh, in June of 97, we got married. Yay! <laughs> that's, a, that's a true happy ending. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, I, I always tease her and tell people that the, the point that I knew she was the one is when she interrogated Liz. And she was <laughs> conducting her oh, the first Bondo interrogation. Party? The whole Bondo <laughs> Party thing. <laughs> they said this. This is my kind of woman. That exactly. <laughs> wow. So that's great. Anyhow, that's great. Uh, part of the reason I'm telling the story too is because you know Mike and I remained friends over the last 20 years. Uh, I got a real quick story on that too. Uh, so Mike calls me in a panic uh, about a year ago. Uh, apparently, uh, he was involved in the shooting. Uh, he described how he thought his stepdaughter was was in trouble. Her boyfriend was beating her up, and he rushed out the door to save her. Um, She's still in his wheelchair? He he actually uh, about, I don't remember exactly when it was. It was probably about seven years after uh, he gained, regained full use of his legs. Uh, a lot of you know, he he attributes it to uh, a miracle. I think a lot of it too was the fact that the the electrodes that were in his legs kept his legs strong enough that the, his spine wasn't completely broken. So it took quite a while, but he regained enough use in his legs that he's able to be a standing person and and able to walk around. But unfortunately, he's now calling me, uh, you know, involved in, in this self-defense case, um, and they were charging him with homicide. I was fully expecting to go down and be a, a, a character witness for him because of, you know, the bravery that he showed me back 20 years ago, but also the fact that I've gone, gotten to know him having, you know, contact with him over the years uh, during, you know, different points of his life just to catch up with them. He used me to, I guess, to always get a, you know, brotherly advice. Uh, so naturally, when he called me, he, he wanted to tell me all about this case. I know Mike never lies to me, and I know uh, that, you know, from the type of person he is, that he feels it's his duty to step in and be the hero, and it's it's not unusual for him to feel like he had to go save his, his stepdaughter from you know, being attacked. The way he tells the story is that he inadvertently ran into the boyfriend walking down the road and confronted him. And unfortunately, the boyfriend tackled him. Well, Mike has always been carrying a weapon around with him because of this case, because he always thought that Dom or, or the mob connections that Big Felix had may track him down. So he always carried a weapon with him. But the unfortunate thing of carrying a weapon with you, it becomes a liability and a struggle. And Mike struggled for his weapon and unfortunately shot this young man that probably had no idea Mike was armed. But Was he licensed to carry? Yeah, Mike's licensed to carry. Okay. Knowing his character, I I fully intend, I fully feel that he felt like his life was in danger or his family was in danger and the only action he could have taken was 
was the one they did. And unfortunately, his his reputation has been tarnished all through the papers because, uh, you know, he was actually charged with the crime. So he felt, you know, comfortable that it was okay for me to tell this story at this time because now anyone can find him, right? Because now he's all in the papers because of the right. Thing. Right, so that's why I probably never would have told the story if he hadn't had gone through that. But um, all the tra- charges were dropped uh, uh, because, they, you know, he, for, from all indications, it was a self-defense, or at least they couldn't show that it was anything other than self-defense. So, Well, how did his stepdaughter feel about him shooting and, and killing her boyfriend? Because, you know, everybody has a fight. Yeah, I, I, I don't. No, for sure, but I think she was pretty upset with Mike about that, and that's not uncommon in domestic situations uh, where your abuser, you know, you're going to forgive them, and that's why you stay in a, a domestic abuse situation. So I don't think she intended that to happen, but it was a tragic mistake, and I think there's their relationship has been strained, I think, from that. So you said that the... Uh the homicide charges were dropped. Why was yes, that? Yes, uh, lack of evidence, and Florida also has a uh, standard ground law. When he was charged with the self-defense homicide, that's when they talked about him being a witness in an FBI hate crime twenty years earlier. Before we go, because I, you know this this has been fascinating just to 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 look at the way this case progressed. And to hear about all the the good things that happened from it, you know, you know with you and Chris and, and getting married and and your continued friendship with Mike. But let me just ask you uh, real quick, if you can just tell me real briefly why you wanted to be an agent. You know, when when did you join the FBI and why did you join the FBI? Uh, good question. I I never intended to be an FBI agent. I was actually a mechanical engineer. I had been working for Department of Defense, and I think I had a couple of brother-in-laws that were cops uh, back then, and and I used to hear their stories, and I and I just noticed that the FBI was hiring engineers, and it sparked my interest, and I said, oh, that sounds interesting. So I put in an application and kind of forgot about it because it takes so long to get through the process, and each stage kind of went by, and I started looking more real, and I was getting more excited about it, uh, and. I kind of stumbled into it. I don't think I ever really thought I was going to be an FBI agent when I was younger, but I, I wanted to do something exciting. And, but I, I did crave my engineering roots, and I think that's why I uh, wanted to became an agent. After my first, you know, six years or so, I was looking to get back into something more technical, and that's when cybercrime caught my interest, and I kind of dove into that. And so, then, when did you retire? I retired in. Let's see, October of 2015. And what are you doing I, now? I'm a chief information security officer for a Silicon Valley company called Brocade. So I'd like to give everybody a, the last word, a, a chance to either sum up your career or, or sum up you know, your thoughts about the case that uh, we just discussed. So the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, it was a fantastic career. I don't think, you know, I don't think when I went into it, I really knew what I was getting into. And I think my experiences that I had as an FBI agent, um, I never would have gotten as a, as an engineer to, you know, sitting in corporate America. I mean, I got to see probably the worst of society and the best of society. Mike, you know, Cates is probably one of the stories of, the remarkable people out there that are willing to to do the right thing. Um, I don't, you know, you don't. I don't think you always get to see that kind of person or people out there, you know, unless you're involved in in, in very uh, very dramatic situations like like you might get involved in in the FBI. Uh, it was a terrific career. Uh, I wouldn't have done anything else. And, you know, I utilize the experience I had with the cybercrime stuff, too, to launch a third career, uh, you know, out into corporate America again and hopefully helping companies protect themselves against cybercrime. And that's the end of the interview. 
As always, back at jerrywilliams.com, you'll find photos of John, his co-case agent for life, Christina Kibbe Chesson, and photos of Michael Katz receiving the Louis E. Peter Memorial Service Award from director Louis Free. You'll also find links to a press release and a comprehensive Philadelphia Inquirer magazine article about the case. If you enjoyed the episode, I hope you share it with your friends, family, and associates. I make it easy for you. At the bottom of the episode show notes, you'll find all the social media share buttons. A listener wrote to me to let me know that he doesn't get to see most of the pictures because he listens to the episodes on his phone. But I want to remind you, if you sign up for my monthly newsletter, I'll send links to all of those show notes to you each month. And you'll be able to go back to those show notes and take a look at the pictures and the newspaper articles. All you need to do is visit my website one time, jerrywilliams.com, and sign up when you see the pop up. When you subscribe to my monthly newsletter, you also get access to the FBI Reading Resource, which is a list of all of the FBI books written by the FBI agents featured on this podcast. Pretty cool. Talking about books, I do have a crime recommendation for you this week. I read Clawback by J.A. Jantz. I read this book because it is about a Ponzi scheme. And as you know, I am writing my second book called Greedy Givers. And it's about a $350 million Ponzi scheme that I worked during my career. I wanted to read Clawback just to get an idea of how J.A. Jantz covered the topic. Her book was a fast read with murders and car chases. Not exactly how I remember my time working white collar cases. But the book was a great read. Here's the premise. When private investigator Allie Reynolds' parents lose their life savings to a Ponzi scheme, her father goes to confront his longtime friend and financial advisor, only to stumble upon the scene of a bloody double homicide. With her father suddenly a prime suspect, Allie and her husband work to clear his name and seek justice for her parents, as well as the rest of the scheme's victims. So again, my crime recommendation for this week is Clawback by J.A. Jantz. And while you're on Amazon taking a look at Clawback, I hope you also check out Pay to Play. Here's the premise to my book. When Carrie Wheeler, a female FBI agent investigating corruption in the Philadelphia strip club industry, is blackmailed by a one-night stand she picked up in one of the clubs, how far will she go to stop him from destroying her career and her marriage? This episode was sponsored by FBIRetire.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. I want to thank you for listening, and I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you. Thank you.